Good morning, everyone. I'm Brian Dill. I'm an international tax partner here at Cherry Beckert. And today we'll be discussing transfer pricing and how it relates to international tax. And we're going to be not as focused on the technical language of a particular code section, but really how you can use transfer pricing from a strategic perspective. What are the compliance requirements for a global operating company? And what are some best practices? And with me today, I have Kirk Hesser, who is, leads our transfer pricing group here at Cherry Becker. I also have Amy Shimon, who is also an international tax partner and has decades of experience and is has great experience, especially with companies that are foreign located coming into the U.S. and navigating some of the transfer pricing issues that are unique here in the U.S. for foreign companies doing business. I also have Raj Tripathi, who is in our international tax practice and has decades of experience and also leads our U.S.-India business corridor and some of the issues associated with transfer pricing that are unique to India and the U.S. A lot of times, and we'll talk a little bit about this today, uh, just because of the different approaches and the different rules and how that can lead to unique situations. And Raj and Kirk can certainly help us through those today. All right, let's see what we're going to talk about today. First slide. So first, we're going to just very basically at a very high level, especially talking about you know, when we talk about transfer pricing, what is it? Um, I think a lot of people know the basics, but kind of how expansive it really can be. We'll talk about that. And then we're going to shift over and talk a little bit about the, the problem that is created by transfer pricing. And then we're going to talk about the bigger problem that transfer pricing creates in a modern uh, environment and where companies are going today. We'll also uh, talk about the solution, documentation and upfront planning. And we'll talk about implementation of transfer pricing and how it has to flow through your company and it's not just a paper exercise. And then we'll look at a couple of case studies and cover some global topics that are in the news currently and not just in the news, they're actually coming to fruition. All right, next slide. So transfer pricing, what is it? At a very high level, it really is the allocation of a company's earnings and expenses and or revenues, depending upon what it looks like, among related parties. And that is a very expansive definition. And Kirk, you want to help us a little bit there with uh, the related party situations and what you run across? Sure. I think that uh, you know most everyone really needs to recognize that there are a number of situations that lead to transfer pricing or transfer pricing documentation and the need for arm's length transactions. And those cover everything from tangible transfers or the sale of goods between multinationals, as well as the transfer of intangibles. Think licensing or situations that uh, cause a royalty to arise, as well as uh, intercompany services between a multinational corporation. And I think one that is overlooked in terms or a lot of times from what we see is in our company financing or providing loans between multinationals. And those also have to be done at an arm's length uh, basis uh, in terms of the interest rate. So, you know, I think that all intercompany transactions need to be thought about in terms of are they arm's length and are we properly planning and documenting them? Agree wholeheartedly there, Kirk. Um, I think what people like to see about transfer pricing, and this is the second big bullet point on this screen, is it, you can achieve tax savings through transfer pricing if properly structured, but it's it's not a tax evasion or avoidance. It has to map to your operations and your supply chain. That's why it's so very important that in transfer pricing, um, you know your operations and your operational flows 
because that is going to drive your ability to uh, move into tax saving strategies. And I think a lot of the, the last bullet point, and I think I'll have Kurt again talk about this, is the we see it all the time in our practice here is uh, the failure to identify all of the intercompany activities. I think a lot of people say, well, these are the only transactions that I have via our accounting records, but your accounting records and your journal entries are not necessarily reflective of your intercompany activities. Kirk, any comments there? Yeah, absolutely. I And I, I agree. I think that we see it a lot in terms of everybody thinks about transfer pricing and the sale of goods or the transfer of goods and, and maybe even uh, royalty situations. But there are a lot of misses by multinationals. And um, we even see a lot of times on the information returns and the schedule M's of 5471s or 5472s where, where they're blank. Um, and, you know, there hasn't been consideration given to, uh, for example, are there services being generated out of the parent company that other subsidiaries are benefiting from? Um, have you really done that supply chain analysis to draw out all of the intercompany transactions and all of the services and transfers that are occurring among a multinational? Because I think that you know one of the biggest mistakes we see or oversights that we see is missing intercompany transactions and those typically fall along the lines of services and intangibles and not really recognizing that those transfers are occurring all right next slide transfer pricing what is it at a very high level um i see it all the time I mean, we can talk about it in a an antiseptic academic world, but in reality, if you talk to any CEO or CFO, they are, you know, a world without borders. We are going to be out there generating global profits, and we are focused on our global profits. We are a consolidated, you know, from a gap perspective. This is what we're doing. We're trying to achieve global profits and drive revenue growth or EPUs. And so, but but countries, and this is where we'll get into this, countries are, well, what's my slice of the pie? How much do I get? And without going into, you know, thinking about and being prepared for how a country views transfer pricing, you can oftentimes come up with a somewhat of a shock um you know country a here on this chart share of global profit eight billion dollars i don't know how many times i've seen that people think that well we just have a small operation in a particular country and then come to find out that unwittingly they located their intellectual property there because it's not legal it's beneficial economic ownership uh our customer base is there because of our legal orientation and then all of a sudden they get a big surprise that their profit, you know, with just a few people in country should be a huge disproportionate amount of profit allocated to that particular country. I think we see it all the time. Kirk, any follow up there? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, we'll cover this when we go through the case study, but where you're con conducting research and development is really important to uh, where your intellectual property resides from a transfer pricing perspective. A lot of multinationals will have research and development going on in multiple locations, but they haven't considered what that does to intellectual property ownership from a tax perspective. They may have unwittingly decentralized their IP ownership without uh, proper modifications to their uh, transfer pricing to it to match what they're doing from a global perspective. And it might lead to something, uh, you know, an informal cost sharing agreement, which has a lot of ramifications that we can get into with the case study coming up. Fantastic. All right. Our first polling question. Um, which is important for you all to get your CPE credits. Um, you know what transfer pricing is now, you know, from an overall 
when's the last time you performed transfer pricing documentation in your company? A, our transfer pricing is current, one to two years ago, three to five years ago, or I can't remember the last time I did it. We can't find it. Give a few minutes, uh, give you uh, about a minute there to go through that and answer those questions. And then um, if you have any questions, technical questions, anything, please let us know with regard to your transfer pricing situation. Please type in the question and answers and we'd be happy to uh, uh, connect with you there and talk about your particular transfer pricing questions or what you're seeing in the currently in transfer pricing. All right. There we go. Our transfer 43%, 23, almost a quarter, can't find it. Uh, don't be worried about that. We see that all the time. This is a little bit better than I actually anticipated. Uh, that's great, 43%. All right, next uh, slide. Uh, looks like we're having a little... All right, the next one, the problem and, and what we run into for and what CFOs don't like to hear about and CEOs certainly don't like to hear about is double taxation. What happens is that, and just what Kirk talked about, you have set up your intercompany pricing in sort of a particular way, but your underlying legal obligations and the way you're running your business might differ from that. And what happens is that, as you see, you got $10 billion of global profits and all of a sudden, what do we have? We have a disputed portion uh, between country A and B, $6 billion, both countries claiming that they have the primary right to tax this. Um, and we run into big problems here um, when we have that. Let's go to the next slide. So we have this $6 billion of disputed profits. And what is the issue that we run into? Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about US first. You know, you can read the slide. The, the US does not allow downward transfer pricing adjustments. So what you can't do, let's say if you're in the US, you can't file an amended and corrected return and get a refund um, for this disputed portion. You are subject to what is known as competent authority if you want resolution. And what happens there is that when you have this dispute between governments, you are not technically a party to the settlement because you are an individual actor and you are not a country and so the countries have resolution processes that we call competent authority. And you, the taxpayer, and, and this let's assume you wanted a downward transfer pricing adjustment in the U.S., you would request from the U.S. to enter into a competent authority discussion with the other country. Let's say it's the U.K., assuming they have relations and have a competent authority process, that would then they would take up your request potentially. And those governments would request lots of information from you. You would be at their bequest to give that information. And then on their timeline, they would settle that dispute and come back to you. That dispute might settlement might be good, it has a lot of technical issues with it with regard to how long they take and the statute of limitations and what a particular government will allow you to reclaim if they do settle it. So it is an expensive, arduous process to settle transfer pricing disputes after the fact. Um, Kirk, I know you've gone through several competent authorities. I've gone through competent authority processes. Any comments there? Yeah, I, I think that what can be stressed is just, you know, there there is a real cost here for getting this wrong. 
And, um, you know, the, there's no guarantee that your case is going to be accepted by competent authority, uh, you know, if you uh, submit all of the proper documentation. And uh, Brian did mention the cost of competent authority and even getting into the process is five figures. I think it's uh, it exceeds $30,000, just the entrance fee to get into um, competent authority itself. And, you know, I've seen cases where, you know, it's eight years before there's any kind of a resolution. And um, I know the IRS uh, or APMA is getting better at this. Um, but, it, you know, the key thing here is, there, you know, there's a real cost in terms of time and expense for getting this wrong. Uh, Kirk, we've got a question with regard to that. Can, can we go back one before we get to the polling question? Um, well, I've been talking about global profit and that split of profit. Can you talk a little bit, you know, from a, you know, not going too technical here today, but, you know, the operating profit that you test a lot of time versus the transactional, we're, we're getting questions on well, what's the metric? What about sales? What about expenses? Those type of things. How does that fit into this equation? Sure. It's it, the transfer pricing methods available to taxpayers um, are largely the same, whether you're using the OECD guidelines, which is really the international uh, norm or the U.S. regulations. And the methods are divided into transactional methods where you would look at a, a particular price of a transaction and compare that to third party pricing or they are profit based methods and um, by and large most transfer pricing documentation and studies use some sort of a profitability method uh, because transaction methods are more difficult to apply and uh, there's more comparability criteria that have to be met to employ those methods so by and large, we are talking about profits most of the time because uh, most companies are employing the comparable profits method, where, for example, they'll look at a distributor uh, that will be the tested party and the, any intercompany transactions coming in there by the way of sale of goods are referenced by comparing them to comparable distributors at the operating profit level. And the comparable method in the OECD guidelines would be the transactional net margin method. And I think we see the CPM or the TNMM probably at least 90% of the time. So that, you know, that's why we're talking um, more along the lines of the split of profits than necessarily the, uh, the transactional approach I mentioned. Fantastic, thanks a lot. All right. Um, I see another question, but I'll get to it later. Uh, polling question number two. What are your company's global revenues? We are a startup, less than 50 million, between 50 million and 500 million, or greater than a half a billion dollars. Take some time there. Um, while we're waiting on that, hey, Raj, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, the expensive resolution here, um, especially as it concerns India and your experience there? Absolutely. I think uh, one of the challenges that we face, and I think Kirk and I have been working extensively on uh, the U.S. India corridor with our clients who are trying to set up their back offices in India, R&D centers in India. Uh, I think... Uh, India being very notorious on the transfer pricing, uh, when I say notorious is that the markups are significantly high in India compared to what the US has. Like India will go anywhere between 12 to, you know, 12, 15, 17, somewhere, to, and the safe harbor rule is 22%. But specifically on the services that the subsidiary is doing in the foreign country, in India specifically, the markup could be pretty huge, you know, and companies do not want to park that kind of a profit in the local country. So, and then also the challenge is that um, the requirement is that you have to have a mandatory transfer pricing kickstart the very first year when you start your operations in India. So therefore, we always advise our clients that when you are going to India, setting up your subsidiary, a back office, R&D center, make sure that you are not only looking at the transfer pricing from India side, but also from the US side. 
because both the US and India company authorities, they don't talk to each other. The US will say markup should not be 12, 14, 18%, whereas the, you know, uh, India will say, no, my markup is based on what, you know, services you're rendering. So we uh, basically, me and Kirk will come up with some kind of a transfer pricing mechanism between the US and India to make sure that the markup and the documentation that we prepare is palatable to the U.S. tax competent authority and the India competent authority. So this is something very important that companies should start thinking about, which they overlook when they go set up a subsidiary in India or a back office in India. Yeah, Kirk, you want to add thanks, something Roger. to that? No, I couldn't agree more. And 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 I think that at least India has be, been becoming a little bit more reasonable in terms of their markups. Um, I would say probably 20 years ago, they were even higher than they are now in terms of what they expected right. for a uh, a service provider, particularly a software developer or any kind of developer. Um, I think over time, um, you know, through practitioners working on both sides of those transactions, they have come down a little bit. Um, but, you know, I totally agree. You need to look at both sides and, and come up with something that uh, that meets expectations for the tax uh, tax authorities on both sides of the transaction. All right. Great. Hopefully I didn't mess up our production crew just by no, the polling, deviating a little bit. Uh, um, do we have the, uh, yeah, polling we have the, the polling results? Ah, there we go. So a nice split there, very nice split. And I would say to all of you, you all have, you all are in unique positions in your market profile and how you address transfer pricing um, is unique. And in our experience being Cherry Becker, where we service mostly the middle market and, and um, high growth companies and startup modes, I think that, uh, they all have unique positions in how you address transfer pricing. You know, you all have different level of internal resources. Uh, I will not pretend whatsoever to think that it is just an external exercise. It does take a lot of resource time internally to manage your transfer pricing appropriately because it is connected to your supply chain and sale chain. And it, 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 it permeates everything in your organization. Um, if you want to know of somebody that did it wrong, I would just say, go look at, it, it doesn't say transfer pricing, but I would just say, go look at the Weatherford example and um, how many times they had to repost their um, financial statements. And it was all led by bad intercompany accounting. Fantastic. Before we get started on the next slide, Brian, there is a question that coincides with what Raj and Kirk were talking about with India. So when you have to manage a large corporate loss, but there's that markup transfer pricing policy that's creating a gain in the foreign country, um, just like the one that you gave for India, how would you go about managing those aspects? Um, I think, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, please. I'm going to kick this one to Kirk. We we do this all the time. I mean, I, you know, I, I'll give it, I'll start it off and go to Kirk and Raj here. Uh, managing um, when you are in a loss position as a glo global organization, it is, that is the trick, right? You, you're making large global losses as you want to take your global losses, but then you want to have a transfer pricing um, effect that let's say in a smaller country, you know, you want to treat them as a limited risk with a limited markup. H how do you manage that, Kirk? Um, you know, where you're you're bleeding for those first few years and you're gonna turn it around. But uh, what are some solutions we've come up with? I mean, there's no perfect solution, of course. No, and and I think this comes up um, a lot of times in startup companies, and then of course when you have something like recessions or a pandemic, which has which results in global losses, a lot of times your transfer pricing is going to trap profits in these limited risk entities, 
And uh, through our economic analysis or transfer pricing documentation, uh, we try to address this. And um, within the transfer pricing documentation, you know, just a reminder, a limited risk entity is not a no risk entity. And in times like recessions or COVID, when there's a global or an overall loss in a multinational, I typically try to recommend that these limited risk entities are no more than break even. So you're not putting uh, profits into a limited risk entity and paying tax in that jurisdiction when there's an overall loss. And this can be supported in a transfer pricing study uh, by looking at comparables um, and relaxing some of your profitability thresholds in the times of a recession or in times of startup to allow uh, other comparable companies that are also experiencing losses so that you can document that these are economic circumstances uh, leading to this, this loss or break even and not necessarily this is, is not faulty transfer pricing. Um, can we go up one slide um, to the prior slide? Yeah. So. Uh, We've been talking a little bit here. Um, what is the problem? The problem and the bigger problem is that, especially in today's environment of government deficits and coming out of the pandemic, uh, governments are looking to foreign actors to take their share of profits and put them into that. And if you don't have proper planning and documentation, you can easily end up with two countries going after the same pool of profit. And as we talked about prior, you know, resolution after the fact it is not a good way to go about it. It comes up with documentation and upfront planning. I know everybody wants to just get into the country and get moving, but a little bit of upfront planning and documentation go a long ways. So a couple of the questions that have come up here, you know, I think are talking a little bit about this, um, Kirk. One is uh, IP, you know, where's IP is located? How does that impact your transfer pricing adjustments? And the other, if you'll take the other question, I'll ask them both at the same time is, and we see this all the time in finance, um, when you have intercompany loans, and how do you avoid um, on an intercompany loan? Can you can you have built-in debit debt and credit adjustments or interest rate variability? Are there things you can do? You know, you just don't have to have the regular intercompany agreement where you're locked into a particular interest rate or term that you can have some variability there. And I'll turn that over to you, Kurt, a little bit about those two questions on IP and financing. Sure, um, intellectual property or IP uh, really is one of the key drivers of transfer pricing and particularly where it's located. And um, you know, most companies have their IP centrally located. And from a transfer pricing perspective, that typically means that all uh, residual profit resulting from transfer pricing is going to end up where the intellectual property is located. So in other words, if you have uh, in the US a headquarter company and distributors in multiple countries, those distributors are going to earn a distribution profit and all residual profit uh, resulting from the sale of goods in those countries is going to go back to the US as the IP owner. Um, on the other hand, you can through a cost sharing arrangement or licensing arrangements more decentralize the use of your IP or IP ownership. And that has the effect of spreading the profit uh, throughout the organization through the transfer pricing as well, either through a cost sharing agreement where you can potentially eliminate royalties or charge an entity a uh, royalty in a foreign jurisdiction and give them the rights to manufacture, make use and sell in their country. And then uh, only a portion of those residual profits would come back to the IP owner. And the second piece of that uh, 
question or the second question was really around intercompany agreements and adjustment mechanisms. And, and the question was in terms of intercompany loans or intercompany financing. But, you know, I would say in any intercompany agreement, you should really give put in a clause that, that gives yourself the right to adjust, um, you know, post year end or if results uh, aren't what were expected uh, through the intercompany agreement, it's really a good idea to give yourself an adjustment mechanism uh, because a lot of countries or a lot of tax authorities do not allow such adjustments if you don't have that within the intercompany agreement. Um, so I think I think that goes beyond even the the intercompany loan or intercompany financing in terms of having that built into your intercompany agreements. One of the questions comes up uh, that, that came up in, in the Q&A here is, you know, is the U.S. the most stringent? And and I, I find that I, I don't mean to laugh about it, but no, the U.S. is not the U.S has the most comprehensive documentation requirements because you know what we are the birthplace of transfer pricing you know i've been around a long time and when transfer pricing really came to the forefront was in president clinton's state of the union address where he said he was no longer going to allow japanese companies to strip profits out of the United States, which was his thing about transfer pricing, because what was happening were the Japanese auto companies were setting up like Toyota North America and Toyota North America had zero profit and all of the profits were retained back in um, retained back in Japan through their transfer pricing efforts. And certainly a lot of regulations came down. It, I mean, transfer pricing has been around since the 80s. But it, it has come a long ways from there. Uh, another thing is, I think, Raj, you can talk a little bit about India, how stringent they are. Amy, your experience in Europe, something like Germany and what they're doing, that, that would be very helpful here. So, uh, Brian, I totally agree, uh, especially when you're talking about the IP planning. Uh, as uh, Kirk did mention, that uh, when you're setting up your R&D center in India, software development centers in India, India will have a higher markup because that's what they're looking for. As Kirk said that historically they were the markup would go much higher, but now they've become more relaxed. But uh, IP planning is equally important because if you don't have a proper intercompany agreement with India, when the software is being developed in India, your agreement should specifically say what are the rights or sublicensing rights you're giving to the developer. Otherwise, you don't want the government of India coming back and claiming that, hey, your intercompany agreement is not very clear. Therefore, any future development of the IP, the rights is sitting in India, and we have the rights of that IP. So therefore... What, what, hey, Raj, what's the penalty in India for not having transfer pricing documentation? Oh, the penalty in India, first of all, the very first year, you have to have your transfer pricing. Otherwise, you they will disallow your deductions. Uh, the penalty... the. The penalty is not as severe as in the U.S., but the disallowance of your entire deductions on your tax return is a significant uh, challenge for you. Because if you have a operations in India, back office operation, and you have 100 employees, and your cost is, let's say, a million dollar, and the markup is, let's say, 14%. So 14% markup is where your profits are, but that a million dollar of the deductions, they'll disallow. It means that you'll have to end up paying your income tax of 26.75% at that million plus 14%. If your deductions are disallowed, if you don't have proper transfer pricing. And, and Andy, what's your experience in Europe? Well, I've done a lot with U.S. German uh, businesses, of course, and many of those are small to midsize. On a smaller scale, there's thresholds in Germany, for example. So when a company reaches a certain size, revenue size, then they'll take a look at that at an annual as a statutory review for transfer pricing. I've seen markups depending on the industry that the particular client is in anywhere between 5% to 20% in general. Um, the bigger the company is, 
the more stringent the German tax authorities will be. They'll take a much closer look at it. Um, but in the mid-sized market, there seems to be a lot more flexibility than when you get up to the $500 million gross revenue companies and up from there. Um, and, and most of our my clients that I'm working on are between 100 million to 500 million. So I've seen it where it's very stringent. And then the tax professionals that I'm working with over there, they're very clear and they document pretty much update on an annual basis. You compare that to here in the U.S., we prefer our clients to do this on an annual basis. If anything economically changes, they update their transfer pricing. But there's also with that mid-market some, some flexibility and maybe they don't need to update it annually, but maybe it's every two years or three years. But do keep an eye on it contemporaneously on an annual basis. And in the U.S., you know, it's, it's like a lottery system in getting picked for an audit. Well, and the feels... IRS, if you're a global business, one of the one of the questions on your IDR is going to be provide us with your transfer pricing documentation. And if you don't have that in place, well documented, it's very tough to turn something around in 30 days. It is. Well, uh, number one, you don't have contemporaneous documentation automatically and the IRS won't allow. You, you're already exposed to penalties if they do make an adjustment but it does give you potentially the upper hand on uh, the ability for burden of proof. Um, one other thing there, you know, when it comes to audits, uh, Kirk, I'll just, just a one word answer. For me, the answer is no. I have never seen an international audit when, when that starts, that IDR number one was not, I, I've, I've always seen IDR number one being transfer pricing, always. H have you ever seen it with not? I mean, I'm sure it's happened, but I've never seen it. And thousands I've of never audits, seen I've, it. I've never seen it. And, and I would just add, I don't think the U.S. is the most stringent in transfer pricing um, in terms of its penalty regime or even aggressiveness in terms of looking at it, but they certainly have the most experience. And um, if you think about it, uh, we were a country with a higher tax rate for years. And the IRS not only was combating the Japanese inbounds that Brian mentioned, but also all of the companies that were trying to transfer their IP offshore. And uh, really the perception by the IRS was there, you know, using transfer pricing to evade tax taxes. And so they do have the most experience in terms of auditing those types of situations, but also you know, all of the rules that they put in place over the years to combat those types of situations are really similar or at least trying to get to the same place that the OECD has been trying to accomplish with the with its BEPS, BEPS project. Fantastic. Uh, but before we move on, just one more thing I'll add. There was a question about Puerto Rico and Act 60, uh, I will say that that we have come across that and the USVI, and I'll just say that the IRS has a specific campaign because the transfer pricing being produced, at least our experience on a lot of these reports, is so poor and they don't address the issues that, uh, unfortunately, we've had several people, taxpayers, come to us after the fact on some of these Act 60 deals and um, have situations because the IRS does have a particular campaign on moving to some of these jurisdictions and taking advantage of these low tax rates and certainly transfer pricing is the way you do it a lot of times in a commercial situation. Um, I'm gonna hurry up a little bit. Let's go to the next slide. Operational transfer pricing, um, quickly, Kirk, it's not a theoretical exercise, is it, you know, I mean, my experience is I'm just going to that sub bullet top side adjustments. That's not going to work. That's where you get yourself into trouble uh, in my experience because it doesn't flow all the way down and it gets you left out. But uh, what's your experience there, Kurt? Because I know you're big on operational transfer pricing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the, the big takeaway here is 
you know, we've seen too many multinationals and clients that put the transfer pricing documentation in place, but have not gone through the exercise of actually implementing it on a day-to-day -day basis and following it. And then the, you know, the next year when it comes time to document your transfer pricing, they're out of the range in certain countries. And since they haven't followed transfer pricing, uh, you know, their results aren't matching their transfer pricing documentation because they haven't gone through the process of implementing it and performing operational transfer pricing, which means uh, invoicing for transfer pricing, uh, settling transfer pricing on a regular basis, and putting those intercompany agreements in place. Uh, you know, it, I almost recommend, or I would recommend, to really do operational transfer pricing first. Get your transfer pricing policies uh, set and uh, do the uh, comparable exercise in the benchmarking and get the operational transfer pricing in place. Then the documentation is much easier if you're if you're following uh, you know what the, what the comparables and the policies say you're supposed to be doing on a monthly and annual basis. Uh, then we don't run into those situations where uh, the documentation hasn't been followed and certain entities are out of the range uh, when it comes time to uh, file the tax return. And, and on that implementation, one of the questions is, when do transfer pricing adjustments need to be booked? Kind of depends. Um, hopefully, any true-ups are being run before you close the books in final um for the year if you make true up adjustments or catch up adjustments after the closing of the books you know that's a materiality question um that depends upon the particular situation uh looks like we're ready for a polling question all right is transfer pricing part of your year in tax planning always and we perform adjustments if necessary Sometimes, if we remember, rarely, or last, we like surprises at tax filing time. And it is that time for extended tax returns here in the U.S. And I can um, empathize with those of you that are going through transfer pricing adjustments for the September 15th or October 15th uh, uh, deadlines. Give that a second. And then the last... But, but I think it's a, a good thing to be, you know, part of the operational transfer pricing is, is really trying to make transfer pricing part of your year end tax planning. Uh, you know, that to me, that would be one of the key takes away from a takeaways from a compliance perspective on transfer pricing is, is really trying to do something before your books are closed. Uh, so you can make those adjustments and uh, not have surprises. All right. Do we have uh all right. Always. Fantastic. You guys are great. Great audience. Really appreciate it. All right. To the next slide. So when we, we're going to switch from the problem now to the solution. Um, um, you know, and I've seen it, especially over the last, say, 14 years, you know, right after the financial crisis of 08, once we started to come out of that in 2010, um, government overreach here. Um, we have seen governments from a transfer pricing perspective. It's, it's you know, we'll talk about BEPS here in a minute. Um, it's certainly number one on IDRs in the U.S. It's big in India, Europe with their requirements. Um but, but I will just say, anytime you legislate behaviors and actions, um, you know, once you read those things, the, the knife cuts both ways, is what I'm going to say, is that if you have upfront planning um, and you are planning transfer pricing, um, you can turn this limit of transfer pricing into lemonade. You can turn it to a benefit. Kirk, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and, and I think that uh, we'll see that a little bit more when we get into the case study is is really planning your transfer pricing, centering around 
uh, where is your intellectual property, um, where are your functions, where are your risks, and when you look at those three things, um, what is mobile, what can be moved, what are your mobile income streams, and can you plan your intercompany transactions around that? Uh, when we talk about looking at supply chains, um, you know, part of that is also when you do look at your supply chain, um, what can be moved in terms of functions, risks, or assets? And one of the key assets is typically intellectual property. And a lot of planning can be done around uh, looking at that in detail and then designing transfer pricing policies that optimize where you put you are putting your profits. All right. And so let, let's just let's go to the next slide. A little bit of a case study here. Um, we'll spend a couple of minutes on this. You know, let, let's say you have a U.S. parented company with a foreign subsidiary and developing a better mousetrap. Kirk, you must have wrote that. So from a transfer pricing perspective, um, you know, in this world of getting ahead, you know, there's a lot of R&D. People are searching for R&D credits. Um, they are looking to go global. Um, so you have a foreign subsidiary that's going to be exclusively dedicated to this research. The salaries of the researchers and overhead costs attributable to the mousetrap will be borne by the U.S. parent and the foreign sub. So I think the big thing here is upfront planning. Key considerations when planning structure and transfer pricing. We're going to show an example of that. Um, develop and define which group company owns the risk assets and functions. And I think we were talking a little bit about that earlier, is that it's not just what you put in the books from an accounting perspective, it's actually who has the risk, who has the asset. And the asset is not legal title, bare legal title to the IP is one thing, who has the economic beneficial ownership of that IP is very important and how you acquire that economic beneficial ownership is also very important that have certain rules around it. And then what functions are gonna be performed in these two different companies, like the R&D, what R&D is gonna be performed, what R&D is performed back in the US. And then overall, and then we, we have a lot of discussions about that with our clients is, where are you going to locate the IP? Is it decentralized? Meaning is it US and rest of world? Is it centralized in the US or some other place? Or is it all in a location of a foreign subsidiary um, is a big deal. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So we'll kind of walk through quickly. Here's, a, here's an offshore transfer pricing model and nothing um, earth shattering here, but showing if you look at the foreign subsidiary, you have an offshore company that is busy with actual tangible goods and where those goods are flowing through. You're seeing that the raw materials are flowing through from a financial perspective through the foreign subsidiary. So the foreign subsidiary is actually contracting legally with the third party suppliers. So the foreign subsidiary, the president there, the purchasing managers there are contracting with third party suppliers while the raw materials are actually going to a third party manufacturer. And that actually could be a third party or a, a related party manufacturer has some issues, but we could deal with that. And then the finished goods go directly from third party manufacturer to the third party UK customer, or sometimes it might go to the foreign distributor with inventory and see you can see the financial flow differing from the actual physical flow of goods and how we separated that and what that does is it bifurcates physical from financial and who has the risk associated with it and in this case the ip may be owned by the us so that the foreign subsidiary has to pay a royalty um, they may jointly own it, the U.S. and foreign subsidiary. 
so that there has to be a cost share sharing payment, or the foreign subsidiary might totally own it and pay through a dividend from that perspective. Any comments there, Kurt, going through it quickly? Or yeah, up just on time? Uh, yeah, exactly. The, the, the complex piece of this from a transfer pricing perspective is really getting that cost share payment royalty or uh, cost share payment or royalty correct between the U.S. company and the foreign subsidiary. And the complexity rises in this structure if we get into a cost sharing situation where the U.S. company and the foreign subsidiary are going to jointly own the IP from an economic perspective. And that, that's where we get into the idea of a cost sharing agreement or a cost sharing arrangement where the U.S. and the foreign subsidiary would jointly own the rights and they would jointly pay for the development of the uh, IP on a going forward basis uh, based on their respective net benefits. Um, that also you know, brings rise to a situation where you might have to get some uh, you know, initial IP development rights out of the U.S. into the foreign subsidiary, which from a U.S. perspective is typically called a platform contribution transaction, or in the older regulations, it was always referred to as a buy-in payment. Um, and all of this has to be done on an arm's length basis. Um, and, you know, like I said, the cost sharing arrangements get a little bit more complex. Uh, the royalty, not so much. Um, but, you know, again, all of this has to be done on an arm's length basis. And, and, and for this, uh, certainly, uh, I'm not going to pretend that a, a smaller company can do this. This is a you know, these are for companies that do have some presence about them and are able to have operating foreign subsidiaries with people that can make management decisions. And, you know, if you're asking me, well, where do you see these foreign subsidiaries? It kind of depends. You know, if you want the Facebook model with uh, Ireland, that's certainly a good jurisdiction, even though it's going from 12 and a half to 15 percent. If you're in the chemical or petrol industry, and in trading, you know, Switzerland is a big deal. Um, we certainly deal with Switzerland all the time and Zug being one of those more uh, 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 advantageous uh, cantons. Um, Switzerland is a big deal. Uh, so those are just two to give you an idea of where we deal with when you're gonna locate a foreign subsidiary offshore and where we have experience, um, but is, Kirk said, it, it is that platform contribution and that you have to implement all the agreements and it all has to be at arm's length. But there are significant savings for those that can implement these type of structures properly. Now, if you don't operate it, you don't do it properly, I'm not going to pretend and we're not going to get into it today. But, you know, just go look at the Coca-Cola transfer pricing issue. This is a little bit of Coca-Cola right here and the issues that can pop up if you don't do it right and you don't have everything in place and the billions of dollars that are on the table with the Coca-Cola transfer pricing issues. Uh, next you know, slide. The last thing I'll add oh, to that, ahead. Brian, is just to say that um, the upfront planning piece of this is key here as well. And the time to get into these types of uh, models would be when the IP does not have that much value. In other words, uh, when you're starting up a product line or sometimes in the case of startups, even though you know it, this would be a complex model for a startup, the time to really get into that IP sharing is when the IP value is low. It, it's, it's more important than it ever has been um, post TCJA after 17 because of the goodwill rules and valuation, just to let you know. So it is, it has never been more important than to do this earlier rather than later. Uh, next slide, we're up on time and I want to give a couple of minutes. Um, we've kind of gone through those, the, the benefits and the detriments here. Um, what you're really doing is you're generating profits offshore in a low tax jurisdiction and your ability to reduce profits and taxes in high tax countries. And that IP grows in value offshore in a low tax jurisdiction. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. And here, this is the same example, uh, 
as you see, but it's using a U.S. principle situation. And I will say that the U.S. principle, the U.S. centric pricing model from an international tax perspective has never been better than it really has. You know, once you, you know, with the energy credits, with R&D credits, with foreign derived intangible income benefits, um, if you still use an IC disc and you're private, the U.S. principle uh, with the lower corporate rate of 21 percent uh, certainly makes a lot of sense. The downside of the U.S. principle is that we are not a favorable taxing jurisdiction on a long term basis. You see the pressure now from certain parties that they want to push the corporate rate back up to 28 percent. They will want to get rid of some of the export benefits. So once you're locked into this, though, as we talked about, once that IP value goes up and you're locked into a U.S. principal structure, it may be too expensive to get it offshore. And those are the real business decisions people have to make when they choose their pricing models. Um, I'm sorry for time. We'll go to the next slide. Just what it does right now, you can really drive down the rate to the 13 and a quarter. Um, you can avoid the cost of IP models, but the, the change can really drive you if there is a tax change here in the United States. Next slide. Polling question. I think the next polling question is, um, we don't have to answer this. Uh, it's really, would you like for a team member to reach out to you after today's webinar with regard to transfer pricing? And you know, if you don't know or you need to talk to your company, is it yes? Maybe in the future you would like to have discussions with us. We'd certainly welcome the opportunity to talk with you and or know that you already have transfer pricing buttoned up. And then another thing that came in, what about offshore employees that provide services to other countries? Um, you know, that's country to country. And that web of transactions, you may have to have um, transfer pricing between foreign subsidiary one and foreign subsidiary two. It may not just be from the parent company. Uh, you may have to have transfer pricing between entities there. Is one of the questions that came up. And... All right. And uh, Kirk, you want to talk really quickly, give us a minute before we wind up everything to talk a little bit about uh, just what you're seeing in, in BEPS and Pillar 2 and Pillar 1, I'm sorry, and 2. Yeah, I mean, uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 continue to gain traction. And, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, it's uh, the latest effort by the OECD to uh, find ways to tax multinationals that they uh, that they deem are fair. Um, pillar one is really geared towards uh, your largest of large taxpayers. Um, as you see there, the threshold to get into that one would be uh, 20 billion of euros, at least 10% uh, of uh, net profits. And then pillar two, um, or that minimum tax, would really cast a wider net, and that's really a minimum tax in jurisdictions, and that applies to companies that are over 750 million of euros. So it would really be the same companies that are required to file country by country reports. And then you've also got this amount B, um, if we go to the next slide, which is uh, a more of a safe harbor, uh, one more slide, um, on distribution transactions. And um, there are safe harbors in place for services, uh, both by the OECD and the U.S., and the U.S. has a safe harbor for interest rates. Um, this would be more of a safe harbor for distribution-related transactions and would give a fixed return based on industry and um you know the the what industry they're in and what type of asset intensity they have regarding uh, certain metrics. So uh, it's a latest attempt by the OECD to simplify transfer pricing in some respects. And then if we go one more slide, just to wrap things up, um, I do want one more slide. Uh, I do want to mention that Brazil, if you haven't heard, 
um, used to be a really difficult place to do business from a transfer pricing perspective as their rules were considered non-arm's length and it was pretty mysterious how they did their transfer pricing and I don't think anybody outside of Brazil really understood it. Um, but starting this year in 2024, they have adopted all of the, the arm's length principle and the OECD documentation requirements in terms of requiring a master file, a local file, um, as well as incorporating all of their transfer pricing methods. So um, Brazil is finally on board and they uh, have adopted the arm's length principle, which is a, uh, which is a very welcome site. Fantastic. Thanks, Kirk. Well, I'd like to think we're right on top of the hour. I'd like to thank everybody, Kirk, Amy, and Raj. Thank you so much for your contributions today. And for those that uh, hung with us, um, if there's anything we can do for you from a transfer pricing perspective, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks, everyone. <music>